Welcome to Jammin' with Jason Mefford, a show where we discuss topics relevant to chief audit executives and professionals in audit, risk, and compliance. We discuss the technical and soft skills needed to navigate the minefields of organizations. You hear best practices and practical advice for helping you advance your career, and we'll even talk about music, mindfulness, and psychology, because we can. So sit back and relax while you listen to the number one podcast in the world for internal auditors, unscripted and unedited. Welcome back, my friends, to another episode of Jammin' with Jason. Hey, thanks for hanging out with me again this week. Now, before we get into uh, talking about our topic this week, uh, that traditional internal auditing is dying. Ooh, that sounds kind of scary, right? Uh, but I'll get into that and explain why I'm actually saying that. Uh, there's, there's been some things that have come to my attention the last week or two uh, that just kind of go again in that vein that I wanted to make sure and share with you. Uh, but before we do that, I wanted to do a couple of uh, quick shout outs to some listeners. Because um, as I've told you before, you know, I... I do this podcast each week for you and uh, love to hear feedback from people. So if you're listening to this, uh, you know, make sure and connect with me on LinkedIn. Send me a direct message. Let me know what you like about the podcast and uh, you may be featured here in the future. Uh, so this week I wanted to uh, do a shout out to Todd and I think it's Emge is how you say it, E-M-G-E. -E. So Todd. Todd says, I'm a weekly listener of your podcast, which is always insightful. And he found it through a shared contact. He says, I regularly walk away with new insight that I try to apply to my life and career. Thanks for the great resource. Well, Todd, you are welcome. I'm glad that you're listening each week. And uh, the point that I really liked about what you said there too, is that you walk away with new insight that you try to apply to your life and career. And my friends, that's what I am hoping each of you are doing, that you're getting insights, uh, that you're looking at things, uh, but that you're not just listening, but that you're actually starting to apply these things to your life and your career. Because <clears throat> ultimately, yeah, I can sit here and entertain you, you know, for a half an hour or so each week, uh, but if you really want the transformation and if you want your life and career to be different, you need to get out and actually start applying some of these things that I'm talking about. And so, you know, just like most of the other episodes, I'm going to try to give you some things today uh, to think about. But please, please, please go out and actually apply some of these things uh, and change your life, change your career. That's why I do this. Okay. <laughs> Now, um, I also wanted to let you know before we get into the episode as well, um, I have started, I think I, I mentioned before, I'm probably going to go to two a week. Well, I am going to two a week now. So there will be two episodes each week. Uh, and, I'm, and so there will be the normal episode on Tuesday that comes out. <clears throat> and usually on Tuesday, it's always going to be original content. So it'll be new, uh, new episodes that haven't aired before. And then on Friday, I'm doing what's called Flashback Fridays, okay? So a lot of the Friday episodes, that'll give you something to listen to over the weekend. Um, most of those Flashback Friday episodes are some best ofs. So they're going to be replays um, of some of the most listened to episodes uh, or the ones, you know, again, that I think can have the biggest impact, <coughs> excuse me, on helping you to transform your life and your career. So watch for those. There was one actually this last Friday uh, that, was a, that was a replay. We did our first flashback Friday this last week. Uh, so you can find that there. And again, there will be new episodes or there'll be uh, episodes each Friday as well. Like I said, there'll either be flashback Fridays, which are, are repeats uh, of some of the most listened to podcasts. And you might be sitting there saying, why do I need to listen to it if I've already listened to it before? Well, I go back and listen to certain podcasts that I've listened to before a second or third time uh, because usually we will get something out of it different uh, each time that we listen to it. 
And so again, you know, I'm big on learning and repetition is one of those ways for us to learn. Uh, so going back and listening to some of the past episodes will be good. It'll help you. Uh, the other thing is on Fridays, I'm, uh, you know, most of the time on Tuesdays, we're talking about internal audit, risk management, or uh, compliance type topics, things that relate to uh, specifically kind of professionals in those areas and chief audit executives. Uh, but some of the Friday episodes, I'm going to actually do some um, new content uh, episodes as well on Friday. Those are going to be more, um, you know, kind of whatever I feel like talking about. So they may or may not um, necessarily relate to your business career, uh, but there are going to be things about, you know, psychology, music, mindfulness, other things that are important, things that I feel like talking about uh, that will also improve your life as well. So some of those may, may not be as business related, but again, there's a lot of uh, things that I want to share with you and uh, figured that I got to be putting out more than one a week uh, to be able to get the content to you. <clears throat> okay, one more little housekeeping thing and then let's jump into what we're going to talk about today. Um, the other thing again is if you are enjoying listening to the podcast, please share this with other people. Um, you know, I did the shout out to Todd. How did Todd find the the uh, podcast? Well, one of his, one of our shared contacts actually suggested it to him. So if you're enjoying it, other people are probably going to enjoy it as well. Uh, so do me a favor this week, just reach out to five people that you know, uh, and uh, say, hey, this this podcast is great. Go take a listen to it. You know, you can also post on social media. Um, you know, again, post on there and say, hey, I just listened to this this podcast episode. It was amazing. You should go watch, listen to it as well. Tag me um, on that so I can jump into the conversation. I would really appreciate that as well. Because uh, like I said, I'm trying to, uh, you know, help people get these new insights and start applying some of these things to their life and career. Okay, so go out and share because sharing is caring. Now uh, today, you know, again, our, our title is traditional internal audit is dying. And uh, I want to kind of start off um, giving you a little history lesson and talking a little bit about history. Uh, and you'll see, just bear with me, you'll see how this ties into our topic for today. Uh, but if you've been following me for a while, you know that I like music. Uh, and I, I love rock and roll. And so I wanted to start off talking about Elvis, the king of rock and roll, okay? And uh, Elvis, uh, you know, in the mid 50s started, uh, started playing, started getting some uh, success. People were liking his music. It was different uh, than most of the things that they'd heard at the time. And so his popularity started going up. But a lot of people at the time looked at him and here he was this long haired uh, guy that kind of had this greasy pompadour and he looked really kind of different than, than, you know, most people did. And when he would perform, he'd do some weird things like he'd shake his hips and he'd kind of dance around and he'd make these funny, funny faces. Actually, if you go back and listen to some of the old or look at some of his old performances where he kind of snarls up his mouth and does some different things like that. But obvious to everybody at the time, Elvis was a little bit different. He didn't fit the mold. You know, at that time, most people were listening to big band music. Uh, you know, they were, they were listening to, to what we call crooners, people like, you know, Bing Crosby, um, Frank Sinatra. I love both Bing and Frank uh, myself, you know, great, great singers. But that was mainly what people were listening to. And so when this rock and roll thing came along, it really shook up a lot of people. And, um, and what really shook up a lot of people or what really started things going was September 9th of 1956. Now, I know most of you that are listening, and this was even before I was born, uh, but September 9th of 1956, something really important happened. And here's what it was. Elvis ended up going on the Ed Sullivan show. And he performed on the Ed Sullivan show, uh, which at the time was the, the most watched television program in the United States. Now, Ed Sullivan did not like Elvis. 
In fact, he did not like rock and roll. He did not like Elvis. He did not want Elvis coming on his show. In fact, he had, he made some comments to the effect of, you know, Elvis will never be on my show. Okay. And he said some of those things publicly too. That was until uh, one of his competitors, Steve Allen, actually had Elvis perform on the Steve Allen show. And it had huge ratings. And so it forced Ed Sullivan to actually kind of recant and come back and say, okay, well, uh, you know, I said I'd never have Elvis on here, but instead he paid Elvis $50,000 to come on his show. Okay. Now, again, I told you Ed did not like Elvis. And uh, so he made sure, you know, when, when Elvis came on, he told the, the television, the camera crew, you know, this guy likes to shake his hips and, and, and dance around. So make sure that all of your shots are above the waist because we don't want him gyrating and that's just not appropriate kind of stuff. Okay. So Ed told him that. Now the problem was they, 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 they couldn't hold on to that. Right. So the first show, it was really kind of waist up. Um, but after that, you know, they really couldn't do it and had to do more of the full body shots because that's what people wanted. Now, what I will tell you, that's that first show, September 9th of 1956, is such an important date in rock and roll history. There were lots of people all over the world, and I've heard interviews from lots of the top, you know, rock gods and goddesses, if you will, that uh, they were watching the Ed Sullivan show and they saw Elvis and something inside of them clicked. And many of these people were inspired by Elvis and decided to become musicians. Now, it, you know, on September 9th, 1956, one of those people that was probably listening was a little boy in Minnesota named Robert Allen Zimmerman. And most of you probably haven't heard of Robert Allen Zimmerman. He was a young boy that grew up in Minnesota, but I'm guessing again at that day, you know, on that day, he was probably watching the Ed Sullivan show with his family. And I'm sure again, that there was something that was pricked in him and led him to become a musician. In fact, he is probably one of the most famous musicians of all time. Uh, and many of you have never heard of Robert Allen Zimmerman. And the reason for that is because Robert changed his name when he went into show business because Robert Allen Zimmerman is a mouthful. And so instead, he chose to change his name to Bob Dylan. And I'm sure that most of you listening have heard of Bob Dylan. And um, the influence that that had, and, and I'm going to tie this all back to internal audit again here in just a minute is that, you know, Bob Dylan went on to become probably, um, you know, one of the most respected, and he also influenced other people. In fact, to the point that uh, Bob Dylan is a Nobel laureate. So he actually won the Nobel Prize for Literature uh, because of the poetry that was included in his music and because of the social impact uh, that he had on the world through his music and through other people. Now, again, you know, if we go back to Elvis, like I said, Elvis actually inspired many of the people who uh, led the revolution, the rock and roll revolution. And, uh, you know, Elvis by himself, he became the, the, the top selling solo artist of all time uh, until a few years ago when Garth Brooks actually took over that lead. Uh, but, but, but huge impact, right? And again, it was somebody at the time that when he started playing, and even when Bob Dylan started playing, people would look at them and think these people are crazy. They don't know what they're talking about, right? Even to this day, you know, my, my father, uh, you know, thinks Elvis is an idiot. He just didn't know what he was doing, right? But, but Elvis had this impact on so many people. In fact, it even crossed the pond over in England. You know, another little group that you might have heard of called the Beatles. Uh, Elvis was a huge, huge influence on them as well. Um, so wh where, where am I going with this? Well, um, you know, again, in our profession, 
uh, we've been going along, you know, for a long time, kind of doing the same old traditional kind of stuff. And, and I, I won't get into all the history today because I've, I've talked about it a lot of other places. Um, but, you know, we've really been a lot of internal auditors have pretty much been doing the same kind of auditing that has been done for 200 years. Now, I know a lot of people would stand up and say, no, 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 that's not the case. Well, it is if you go back and actually take a look at it. And what's happening today in our profession is the same thing that was happening to rock and roll in the 50s and 60s. There was this traditional music and there were people like Ed Sullivan. There's people like Ed Sullivan in our profession who say, oh, I don't like these people. They don't talk about the right things. It's not traditional. It's not right. Okay. And the same thing is happening in our profession today. But I'll tell you, you can't stop it. Just like Elvis showing up on the Ed Sullivan show, September 9th of 1956, rock and roll was here to stay. And it, it wasn't about to come back. It didn't matter how many people would stand up and beat their chest and say how horrible it was. You know, funny side story as well, right? I told you my dad, my dad never really liked Elvis. He didn't like the Beatles either, okay? And uh, this one day we were, we were driving to work. He was a contractor and I used to go to work with him starting when I was about eight years old. <laughs> and we were in the summertime between school. I still went to school as well. But in the summer, we were, you know, we were driving to work and he was listening to his easy listening music. It was really uh, music that had been put to an orchestra, okay? And so he's sitting there humming along, you know, to this song that's going on. And I said, um, this is a pretty good song, Dad? And he said, oh, yeah, this is a great song. I love this song. And, uh, you know, because it didn't have any words to it. It was just the music. And I said you know, dad, do you know who, do you know who wrote that song? And he said, Oh, I don't know. You know, I like the song. It doesn't really matter. I said, well, dad, the Beatles wrote that song. And he said, Oh no, this is a great song. The Beatles couldn't have written that. Right. <laughs> kind of a thing. Okay. So what I, what I'm saying is just like the traditional music of the big band and a lot of the crooners in the fifties and sixties was slowly dying. People didn't want to admit it. Okay. But the problem was things were actually changing. And let's go back to Bob Dylan. One of the songs that he is most recognized for and that you've heard me refer to before is the times they are a changing. And it's such a beautiful song as well as from a lyrical standpoint. You know, and, and again, you probably know how this all starts off, right? Come gather round people wherever you may roam. And admit that the waters around you have grown and soon it, it, soon you'll be drenched to the bone. If your time to you is worth saving, then you better start swimming or you'll sink like a stone for the times they are a changing. Okay, you know how that song starts, right? But you know, there's some very poignant lines in here and, and you know, one of the verses in particular that I just want to read to you at this point, because I think, again, this captures what we are going through in our profession at this time. And it says, come mothers and fathers, okay? And mothers and fathers are kind of those, those authoritarian, the, the, the people that kind of control everything. They're the leaders. They're the ones that tell us what to do, right? So translate this into your own career and into internal audit, okay? It's what I'm trying to get you to do. So come, mother, come mothers and fathers throughout the land and don't criticize what you can't understand, okay? And again, I told you that story about my dad. My dad would criti criticize rock and roll because he didn't understand it. It didn't fit into his model of the world and he couldn't understand it. And a lot of people that have been have been, you know, growing up and have been doing traditional internal auditing for so long, they cannot understand that there would be a different way to actually audit, okay? So come mothers and fathers throughout the land and don't criticize what you can't understand. Your sons and your daughters are beyond your command. Your old road is rapidly aging. Please get out of the new one if you can't lend your hand for the times 
they are a changing. And again, the times are changing in our profession, my friends. And, uh, you know, if you happen to be one of those people that's still kind of stuck in the traditional rut, well, if, you, if you're not willing to help and try to create the new internal auditing and actually help change our profession, then please just get out of the way and let those of us that are trying to make an impact do what we need to do. Don't be a dick like Ed Sullivan and try to say, I'm not going to let Elvis show up on stage because he says things I don't want to hear. Because the future is coming. The times are changing. And if you can't help, please get out of the new road if you can't lend a hand. But what I would say is lend a hand, folks. Let's make this world better. Let's make our profession better as well. Okay. So <laughs> I love music. And there you go, folks. There's a story about rock and roll and how it really translates back into our particular profession. Now, I told you at the beginning, you know, again, many of you are going to look at this title and go, Jason, internal audit is not dying. Well, let me tell you some information that I came across this last week. And it just confirms a lot of the things that I've been seeing now, you know, starting 20, 25 years ago, but it's been speeding up in the last few years. And that is one of the people, uh, one of the chief audit executives that I work with, uh, she, ha she happens to be in the Chief Audit Executive Forum um, that I run. She is in the process of looking for a new position. And uh, she told me, you know, there's this one opportunity that I'm looking at, and I'm going through the second or third round interview. And uh, she said, you know, it's, it's really interesting because this position became open just the last few months because the company chose to fire the Chief Audit Executive that was currently there. So this isn't a new thing, you know, where she would be going in and starting a new department from scratch. This is an internal audit department that was there, but there was a chief audit executive that the board and the executives wanted to remove. Their reason for removing that chief audit executive is they were performing traditional auditing and they were looking for someone who would be more progressive and more risk based. Okay. Boom, there's a nail in the coffin for internal audit, right? Is that again, if we continue to do what's called traditional auditing, which is more historical in nature, very low level in the processes and internal controls of an organization, the executives and the board, that is not what they want, okay? They want someone who is more progressive, huh? You know, traditional music to rock and roll. Rock and roll is more progressive, isn't it? Um, they're seeing this and they're starting to take action as well. Now, like I said, this last experience, it just adds on to all of the other uh, <laughs> stories and things that I'm hearing about internal audit being downgraded. You know, firing the chief audit executive, bringing in somebody at a lower level. Uh, offloading a lot of the information or a lot of the work that internal audit had done in the past to the compliance department or to the SOX department or to other things like that, okay? Now, if you listen to last week's episode uh, where I talked with Hal Guerin, you know, we were talking about relevance and relationships. And one of the things that we talked about is, you know, you don't become relevant by telling people you're relevant, Okay, I can stand up, I can pound my chest like a big gorilla and say, damn it, you know, internal audit is important. And I know that because the Institute of Internal Auditors has been around for 80 years and we have standards and we've been doing all these things that we've been doing. And they say that we're an important part of the governance structure of an organization. And I must have a seat at the table and you must listen to me. And I must, you know, be independent of everyone. And I must do what I need to do and what I feel is the most correct, okay? Now, people, if you're, if you're standing across the table from somebody that starts talking like that and you're the CEO of the company, that ain't going to be good, okay? Because I don't care what you're saying. I don't care what some organization says. I have certain things that I need to fix or there's certain things that are risks to my organization that I need help with. And I don't need you coming in 
and telling me those kinds of things. Now, I tell you this with a lot of love as well, because um, I was a chief audit executive. I've been on that side. I've been an auditor for a lot of my career, but now I'm a CEO of a couple of different companies. And I see it from the management side as well. I was also a you know, head of risk management, ethics and compliance as well. I see it from the peer side as well. And when we show up kind of all idealistic and tell people that we're relevant and you need internal audit, uh, that's just not the case, okay? And while internal audit is important, let me, let me just give you a few numbers here to explain this. Because I think a lot of us inside of our vacuum of the profession, we believe that every organization needs internal audit. That is the belief that we have created within our profession. But I got to tell you, folks, it ain't true. And some of you are going to be going, Jason, that's heresy. I know it's heresy in our profession, but let me give you some numbers to kind of explain this. Okay. In the United States, because I'm just using my numbers from the United States, because this is where I'm based, there are approximately 32 million businesses or companies in the United States, 32 million out of about 320 million people, right? So that's 10 businesses, or sorry, one business for every 10 people in the United States. Now, 32 million organizations in the United States do not have internal audit departments, okay? So if we start looking at those 32 million, and we look down and we find that actually less than 2,000 companies out of those 32 million have 1,000 employees or more. And most likely, unless your company has more than 1,000 employees, you're probably not going to have an internal audit department anyway. Right? So we go from 32 million down to less than 20,000 businesses. Now, if we look at the number of publicly traded companies in the United States. So in the United States, there is a requirement, NASDAQ and the New York Stock Exchange, both uh, after Sarbanes-Oxley came out with requirements that said, if you are a publicly traded company and you are going to be traded on our exchange, you must have an internal audit department, okay? So that became a compliance requirement for publicly traded companies. So all publicly traded companies need to have uh, an internal audit person, at least. There's only 3,700 publicly traded companies in the United States, okay? So what we see there is that 99.9% .9 of the companies in the United States do not have internal audit. Now, why am I saying this? Well, just to again, our belief is every company needs internal audit. That is not a true belief. The reality is most organizations don't need internal audit. Now, is internal audit important? Hell yeah. And if you have multiple stakeholders, if you're publicly traded, if even if you're privately traded, but you have you know different stakeholders that you're responsible for, we need internal audit. Okay, we need internal audit, but we don't need the traditional, historical, low level groups that we have been doing. And again, the reason for part of that too is in the last 20 years, there have been lots of other compliance groups that have been developed and staffed and budgeted in organizations, compliance departments, risk management departments, privacy groups, other things like that, that in the past, Internal audit may have done that work, but we're no longer doing that work because there have been these other groups that have been uh, set up, okay? So again, to go back and, and tell the executives that you need internal audit and we are relevant and you have to invite us to the table is really a silly, childish argument. And most of the executives that I know are going to cry bullshit on you if you try to use that, okay? Because I would cry, I, I, I would call bullshit on you too, okay? My companies don't have internal auditors. We don't need them. 
right? Because of the, because of the organizational structure that we are. So how do we get that relevance? How do we provide value to our organizations? Because again, one of the things that I have been concerned with is now again, you know, shiny objects and, and bright lights, people are starting to use these other terms. So some terms that I've heard recently, value-based auditing. I have no idea what the hell that actually means, okay? Objective-based auditing. I kind of know more what that means, but we already have something that's supposed to be based on objectives. How about ERM auditing? Well, again, that to me is you're only auditing risk management, the risk man enterprise risk management function. And now I'm starting to hear people talk about traditional risk-based auditing and that we need to have value-based auditing instead of traditional risk-based auditing. Well, the fact that people put the word traditional at the front of it means that, and again, in my experience, when I talk to people that, that think they're doing risk-based auditing, if I ask them a couple of questions, I find out that about 90% of the people who think they're doing risk-based auditing are not actually doing risk-based auditing. They misunderstand the concept uh, that came around you know, 25, 30 years ago and the fact why I continue to use the term risk-based internal auditing, even though other people are using these, is because risk-based internal auditing is about auditing those things that are relevant to the strategic objectives of your organization, which means every project you're doing, you should be able to align that with a key strategic objective and risk at the strategic level in your organization. If you can't do that for most of the projects that you're working on, you're not really doing risk-based internal audit. And I know I've got another episode on that uh, on the podcast. You can go back and scroll and watch that. I've got several different courses out on C-Risk Academy as well that get into this in more depth. But folks, we don't need to create a new name, which is usually the same old crap <laughs> that we've been doing before. It's the same old stuff with a different name. We need to be more forward focused. We need to be actually working on those things that our company really needs help with. So, you know, how do we actually do that? Let me give you a few takeaways because again, as I told you, I want to help you to start integrating and doing some of these things, start applying these insights that you're hearing from this podcast. I don't want you to become that CAE who just got fired because the executives and board think that you're too traditional in your nature. I want you to be out there rocking internal audit, being more progressive, being more risk-based in what you're doing, and, and actually aligning what you're doing to what the organization needs. Not what you think it needs, but what the organization actually needs. That's where you're gonna show your relevance. You don't become relevant by telling people you're relevant. You become relevant by actually showing people that you are relevant. Now, how do you do that? Here's a couple of takeaways for you to consider and start thinking about this next week, how you can start doing things different. The first one, how you, how you become relevant, help management solve their problems, okay? Now, again, some of you may say, well, I can't have management telling me what I need to do because I need to be independent and objective. And I would say hogwash to that, okay? We have spent too much time in our profession being idealistic about independence and objectivity. And that is making a huge wall between us and our organizations. Now, those things are important if your management is out of control but I will tell you that is less than 5% of the organizations. So if everybody is, is acting the way you should, if your management's out of control in the 5%, we got a big problem, folks, okay? So solve management's problems. How do you do that? You actually ask them, okay? You ask them what they need help with. So the second one, especially at this time, going through the pandemic and a lot of the things that we're going through, we should be doing less assurance work. 
we should be doing more consulting and more advisory work. Why? Because your organizations need help at this time. You know, I've shared the analogy before, but if we're on a ship and the ship is sinking, you don't go to the captain and say, well, captain, we have these 15 audits that we need to perform. And the captain's going to look at you like, uh-huh, the ship is going down, folks. Why don't you help me actually save the ship? We can talk about this other stuff later. Help me save the ship. So that's what I'm asking you to do as well. Help save the ship that you're on, the company that you're on. Find out what problems need to be solved and see how you can actually help those. Do more consulting and advisory work, especially at this point in time. The last thing for you to consider as well is you all, <laughs> we all, okay, we all need to understand risk and risk-based internal auditing better. As I told you before, about 90% of the people that I encounter do not actually understand risk and they do not understand how risk-based internal auditing, that little thing that even is referred to in the standards and the mission of, of, the, of internal auditing from IIA, they don't understand what that really means. And folks, risk ranking a list of processes is not risk-based internal auditing. It's just risk ranking something that has nothing to do with the strategic objectives of the organization. Okay, so those are your things to kind of think about this week. Go back, figure out what is it that we can do to actually solve management's problems. How can we transition more to doing more consulting and advisory work, especially in this, in this next year or two, while all of your organizations are trying to grapple with this pandemic that we're in? That's going to help you develop the relationships. It's also going to help you show that you're relevant because you're gonna be helping to solve management's problems. And then again, get a deeper understanding of risk management, what it actually is. It appalls me and it is embarrassing how many people in our profession, even in, even in the risk management profession, that claim to be risk experts, but they just misunderstand some very, very basic concepts related to risk management. And if you don't understand some of those basic concepts, everything else is hard for you to get. The other problem, you look like an idiot to somebody who actually understands it. Now, that doesn't help your relevance at all either, right? Because if you start talking, and let me give you an example. I interviewed this man one time for a job. And on paper, on his resume, he had all of the right buzzwords on his resume. And so we looked at it, his, he, he didn't have necessarily all the experience that we were looking for, but his resume looked pretty good and it was a junior position that we were hiring for. And so we brought him into the interview and it was a panel interview. It was me and the, the HR representative that was, was working with our, our group. She was assigned to our group. And so we started, we started talking to him. We started asking him questions and, um, you know, some of the get to know you things at the beginning. And uh, we were about five minutes into it. And I started asking him some questions, some basic questions that from his um, resume, he should have clearly known. So we started talking about COSO. Uh, he didn't know what COSO actually stood for. Uh, we started talking about, uh, I, can't, I can't even remember, this was, it was like 15 or 20 years ago now. Uh, we started talking about some other things, and I, I just started asking him a few questions about some of these words that he had put on his resume. And it didn't take more than two or three minutes for me to realize this guy had no fucking clue what he was talking about. Okay, excuse the French, but I marked E on this for a reason, right? but he had no fucking clue what he was talking about. Now, I see the same thing sometimes when we're talking to other people. We use words, we say certain things, and the other people just look at us with a blank stare and they're think thinking that same thing. You have no fucking clue what you're talking about, okay? 
So get a clue, folks. Okay, <laughs> this is why I'm talking to you. This is why I'm shaking you up a little bit. I love you, but sometimes I'm going to shake you up a little bit because I don't want you to be in these situations where you walk away from a meeting and you are just totally deflated. Okay, I've been there. It sucks to walk away and just realize that you probably just blew any credibility that you just had with this person because you said some things that were just off and they knew it and they could see it, they could feel it, right? And so again, understand risk management better. Um, <laughs> you know, again, I've got courses out there. I've got other podcasts about this as well. Learn about risk-based internal auditing, what it really is, how it really ties back to the strategic objectives of your organization. If you start at that top, that is going to be much more aligned with what your executive management needs. It's going to help them solve those problems that they have at the strategic level. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, you know, if, if I'm an executive and I get a report from internal audit that says, you know, we audited blah, 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 right? And we found that these five controls were not working. And oh my gosh, you know, we need to, we need to fix this. We need to to spend another hundred thousand dollars to improve the control structure because, you know, because of these control issues, you know, we, 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 we lost $200,000. Okay. Now, again, those seem like big numbers, but if I'm an executive and you bring that to me in the back of my mind, I'm going to be saying, I don't really care about that. I've got a 20 million, 50 million, hundred million dollar problem or risk that I'm dealing with, I'd much more rather have help on that than you tell me that I got to create more controls, spend more money on something that has way less of an impact. All right. I'm going to wrap up for today, but my friends, again, I know I kind of shook you around a little bit today. Um, and I told you I was going to do that sometimes. When I, when I see things that worry me, I want to share those with you because I don't want you to get blindsided. I want your life and career to be amazing. Okay. But in order for it to be amazing, you're going to have to do some things. You're going to have to invest in yourself. You're going to have to quit believing the lies and the false stories that many people in our profession are telling you. And so again, with lots of love, shaking you up a little bit. Now I shook you up. Now I'm going to reach through the microphone and give you a big hug uh, because I do love you. I love this profession. I love what we do. Um, I know that we do provide a very valuable service to our organizations when we're actually focused on the things that matter. And that's what my hope is, is that you start focusing on the things that really matter. Uh, you know, you're helping management solve their problems you're, you're helping more in the consulting and advisory work and uh, that you're understanding risk and really what risk-based internal auditing is so that you're moving from that traditional internal audit, which is dying into a more progressive and risk-based, truly risk-based internal audit methodology. So with that, my friends, continue rocking it in the audit world. And I will catch you on a future episode of Jammin' with Jason. Have a great rest of your week. And that's a wrap. Thanks for listening to today's episode of Jamming with Jason. Keep on rocking in the audit world. Have a great rest of your day. And I'll catch you later on the next show. If you'd like to earn continuing professional education for listening to today's episode, head on over to C-Risk Academy at ondemand.criskacademy.com. And that's C as in the letter C, riskacademy.com. Not only do you get a CPE certificate, but you also will have access to the video version of today's show. The views and opinions expressed on this show are that of the individuals and not of their respective organizations.